Hi everyone, welcome. It's uh, our weekly sermon video time and it's always a blessing to be able to uh, teach God's Word. And I, I see where people are watching. I, I hear from some of you and I appreciate that. And I trust that God can use these things. I'm praying that he uses these things for his glory. I need his help. So therefore, we're going to start with prayer like we always do, right? Amen. And we're going to start with prayer. Father God, I thank you. I thank you that you're always faithful. This passage that we're looking at today in Romans 11 expresses your faithfulness to every promise you've ever made. And you are a God that... Um, not only is faithful to your promises, Father, but you are faithful to your people, to those of us that are trusting you and following you. And we aren't always as faithful as we ought to be, and I'm thankful for the way you reach into our lives and correct us. You reach into our lives and challenge us. You reach into our lives and you convict us, Father. I thank you for those truths. And as I look at Romans 11, I realize that we've looked at uh, various aspects of your working in the lives of the Jewish people and also in the way you work through the church. And I pray, Father, that in studying this passage in Romans 11 today that we might gain insight into your trustworthiness, into your truthfulness, Father, the fact that your word is truth, your promises are certain, they are guaranteed, and I pray, Father, that we would begin looking clearly and carefully at your promises. We'd understand what it is that you uh, have in store for us, where you have revealed that, Father. I just pray that. I pray you'll help me as I try to communicate the various aspects of this passage to uh, in this message. And I just entrust it to you, Father. I thank you for our church. I thank you for the people that are involved. I pray for the ministries that we have uh, that we have going, Father. Help us to honor you very well and effectively. Help us to honor you in what we say, do, and act. And I pray that you'll help us to you use us to reach others with the message of salvation. Just bless this time today, Father. Use it for your glory, please. I pray in Jesus' precious and holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. In our in-person service today, we're going to have Carrie and, and Chris uh, Davis. Carrie grew up in the church, and Chris, uh, her husband, and their kids are here. Uh, they're with crew, and they serve the Lord down in Georgia. So I'm just mentioning that. And, and uh, uh, last week we had Jim and Ginger Moore, and that was a real blessing. And uh, I, I just pray that as we go through this month of July, we've got several missionaries that are coming and speaking, that God will use that as also a springboard for us to be mindful of our prayers for them, and also mindful of the fact that we are missionaries ourselves. So I just hope that that's uh, something that we recognize. Today we're looking at Romans 11. And um, I start off, and I'm just going to express the idea of something that, that as, a, as, a, as a youngster growing up in church, there were certain songs we sang on a regular basis. And some of them were thong, songs that were very enthusiastic. Some of the other songs were not so much. And today we don't sing as many hymns. We don't sing as many songs that are known uh, through a hymn book or anything like that. But um, there are certain songs that sometimes I wish we did sing. And one of those is to God be the glory. And I'm mindful of that. To God be the glory, great things he has done. And, and that song is just, it resonates with the reality that we have a great God who deserves all glory and praise. And at the end of Romans chapter 11, where, where we see a doxology, another thing that we used to sing on a regular basis was the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. And as we think of those things, sometimes I wonder, do we understand what it means to give glory to God? We give glory to God through our singing, yes. But we give glory to God also through our actions and through our activities and the way that we respond to things that happen to us. Either we give glory to God or sometimes we give grief to God. And I think it's important that we realize the importance of giving glory. I, I watched this week the funeral service of uh, a man that was one of my professors, Howard Hendricks. He died actually uh, a little over 10 years ago. But as I watched that service, in fact, I read a book that encouraged those who were reading the book to watch the funeral service. And I looked online and I found it. And one of his sons 
actually one of his sons who was a classmate of mine in seminary, he, he made the statement, he says, we're here today to honor my father. But in honoring my father, I want us to make sure we give glory to God the Father, our Heavenly Father. And he said we should never mix up the two. We can honor people, we give glory to God. God deserves all the glory, God deserves all the credit. And as we look at Romans chapter 11, as Paul closes with that doxology, basically what's he say there in that doxology? Uh, he says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who, who has tried to become his counselor? No one can, we realize that. But he's, or who has first given to him that which it might be paid back to him again? And we, you know, we see those things regarding God, but know this last statement. For from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're also going to look at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 in this message. But God deserves glory. And in this message today, I want us to be seeing how Paul, he, he comes to the point of initiating that idea of God gets glory. He gets all the glory. To him, for him, through him are all things. God's in charge. God's sovereignty. We've studied that over, over the last several weeks. And as we consider this message from Romans chapter 11, I'm going to be reading passages from Romans 11 throughout the message and, 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 then, and then commenting on them. And then we'll close with the applications like we always do. But I want us to understand the, the main perspective, the summary statement about this particular message today, this study. That is the idea that the depth and riches of God's wisdom, God's wisdom is so far beyond ours. We have nothing compared to what God's wisdom has. And the, the, the depth and the riches of God's wisdom and his authority as well are absolutely astounding. They're above and beyond. They're above our ability to completely comprehend. We read in the book of Proverbs, we're going to look at a couple passages in Proverbs where, you know, it, it states in there that, that we have certain ideas that we particular, that, that we might particularly think, well, this is important. This is, this is, uh, this is something that's, that's necessary or whatever else. But it says God always weighs our motives. He always weighs our perspectives. God is the one that judges. God's wisdom is above and beyond. And we don't have the capacity to understand God unless we have the Holy Spirit guiding us. And unless we're consistently looking at God's word and reading what it says. And we see as we consider Romans 9, 10, and 11, God, he, he used the nation of Israel. He used the nation of Israel. And if he hadn't used that nation, I wouldn't be saved today. Neither would you if you are saved. God chose, or he, 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 he chooses and uses Israel for the sake of our salvation. Our Savior is Jewish. And yet Israel has not experienced, as a whole, has not experienced the blessings of what they've provided for us as God has used them. And the depth and riches of God's wisdom and authority are absolutely astounding, and they are above our ability to completely comprehend. We, we, we can't come. God's wisdom is so much beyond ours. It's infinite. We're finite. There are certain things God teaches. There are certain things God tells, tells us in the scriptures that we look at that and say, I'm not sure I grasp that as well as I could. I don't see that the way I need to. Or we see where it says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says the things revealed to us by God, they belong to us. We're responsible. We're accountable for those things. But the secret things, they are things that, that, that God holds on to. And we don't necessarily understand all the secret things. The church, for instance, it's a mystery, according to the Old Testament. The book of Ephesians talks about the church being a mystery. And I think it's important for us to realize that many people in today's world, in today's Christian world, since the Reformation, many people are ignoring the promises God's made in the Old Testament. 
They don't understand the promises God made to Israel. And then because of that, they don't understand the promises God's made to us either. And they get those twisted. They get those turned around. And therefore, we need to understand the fact that God's plans, God's purposes, God's promises, they're always perfect. We may not understand, why did you do that, God? Why is that happening? What's going on here? And, and we, we see all these things put together. We realize that God's plans, purposes, and promises, they are perfect. And what we find in that is God is forever faithful in everything that he does. That's what Romans 11 is teaching us. Now, Romans 11 also shows us that God has a plan for Israel. Many people have ignored that reality. I know people, I have friends that have ignored that reality, and sometimes we get in discussions. I try not to argue. I try just to discuss, hey, what's the, what do the scriptures say? In fact, my word to them is, show me, script, show, show me chapter and verse. Once I see it in the Bible, then I may, I may bow to what you particularly say. But I don't think that's true. God has a plan for Israel. We are the church today, and we are going to be taken up into glory someday here in the future, maybe before we die, maybe after we die, regardless if we're followers of Christ, we'll be taken up into glory. But what we see from that is that that is going to be the beginning of the end where God begins to deal again with Israel in a specific way. God has set Israel aside, according to Romans 9, 10, and 11, for a temporary period of time. There are Jews that are saved today, yes, but they're saved because they become part of the church. And we recognize that. But now, as God plans and, and, and shows his purposes and, and expresses his promises, sometimes these things are hard for us to grasp. Now, we've looked at Romans 1 through 8. I've said this in the last few weeks, each week, that it is a power-packed presentation of God's provision for our freedom and forgiveness from sin. That's what Romans 1 through 8 is all about. It tells us this presentation, God's plan of salvation. It isn't always something that was completely expected or understood by people. God had his plans, he had his purposes, and even in his working with Israel. God is going to restore Israel. Some people look at the Bible and say, no, that can't happen. God rejected them because they, 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 they killed the Savior. Well, if the Savior hadn't died, we wouldn't have our forgiveness of sin. So we see that in Romans 1 through 8. We see in Romans 9 through 11 that he asks and answers certain questions. What's God's plan for Israel's future? Will God keep his promises for the Jewish people? Why are there so many Jewish people who are missing out on the fulfillment and blessings of the gospel? Why does that happen? God's chosen people are missing out. Are they going to continue missing out? How did the Gentiles, how did we become God a part of God's plan? How did we get involved? The Old Testament says we're a mystery. And then finally, how does this apply to the church in a personal and practical way? I want us to see that today. Now, the answers to these questions, as we see in the, in the benediction here, in the, in, the, in the doxology, the benediction that Paul gives in Romans 11, the answers to these questions point to God's trustworthiness. They also point to the trustworthiness of God's word. And they prove that Israel is part of God's future plans. And we have this undeniable and un underlying truth that we must embrace. We must understand this. We must always remember this, that because of the sin committed in the Garden of Eden by Adam and Eve, Jesus Christ is the only person who was ever born without sin. He's the only person that ever lived without sin. And we have this sin nature that is a curse to us in a certain sense. But now everyone besides Jesus Christ, who's been born throughout history, they face the reality of condemnation because of that sin. But now the only solution is our Lord Jesus Christ. We know this, but do we totally grasp the impact and the influence of that? Because I need to reach out to, that, to the world around me with that message. So do you. That's something God asks us to do. We are his message bearers. We are his, his messengers of truth. And that's so important, and we've seen that. Now, when we look at Romans 11, we realize that, that uh, 
Paul is writing and expressing that, yes, God has a plan for the future of Israel. And he says that in, clear, in a clear fashion in this passage. We begin with Romans 10, verse 18. As I read and, and, and express what, what we're seeing here, verse 18, he says, But now I say surely that they have never heard, have they? But then Paul says, No, indeed they have heard. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words into the ends of the world. Even though the Jewish people haven't grasped the gospel, their message went out because Jesus Christ, the Messiah, he reached to the Gentile nations as well. Now we read on, verse 19, But I say, surely Israel did not know that, did they? But Moses first said, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding, I will anger you. So Israel, they've heard, they've understood, they see that, that, that the fact, the issue of Jew and Gentile, that isn't necessarily a big problem for many of us, but anti-Semitism is, is rampant in this world. We look at the Holocaust, we look at the way the Jewish nation has been literally persecuted throughout history. And some people say, well, it's because they killed the Messiah, but no, I think it's because there's a certain sense where God is working through Israel to reach the Gentile nations, yes. But now we read on verse 20 here of chapter 8 of chapter 10. It says, And Isaiah is bold and says, I, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest, or I was revealed to those who did not ask for me. Talking about the Jewish nations there. But as for Israel, God says, All the day long I have outstretched my hands to you, to a disobedient and obstinate people. We see that, and then we read on, verse 1 of chapter 11. It says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. And we read that, and he goes on and says, but what Elijah the prophet expressed and other things, he says, but he finally says, it's always of grace. He says, there's an, a remnant amongst God's people. There's a remnant of the Israelites. There's a remnant of the Gentiles, in a sense. It's always by grace. It is no longer a basis of works. Otherwise, grace is not grace at all. And we see this, and what we recognize in this passage here is that even though Israel has been obstinate and disobedient, God hasn't rejected them. They, they may not be saved, but God hasn't rejected them. Their lostness is due to their own sin. Their lostness is due to their own choices. Israel heard, but they didn't heed God's warning. They heard, it says it right there, but they didn't heed God's warning. There are some Jewish people who have trusted in the Messiah. Throughout history, there have been a, there's been a remnant of Jewish people who have trusted in the Messiah. Most Israelites are blinded to the truth, but not all of them. But what we find is, as Paul is writing here, talking about a partial but not permanent setback for the Jewish people. But is there, there's a powerful purpose involved. A partial but not permanent setback with a powerful purpose. And what's that powerful purpose? What we find in the next verses here. I read from verses 11 and following. I'm not going to read the whole section, but chapter 11, chapter 11, beginning verse 11, he says, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be, but by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles in order to make the Jewish nation jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much greater how much more will their fulfillment be? There's an expression there. There's going to be a fulfillment where Israel is going to come to faith. That's a future promise. What we find here is that Israel's resistance toward the Lord resulted in the church. We exist today because of Israel's resistance. But we should always remember that our faith has Jewish roots. We read on in this passage and it says that, um, he says, I'm speaking to you Gentile, who are Gentiles, and as much as I'm an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. 
For if their rejection is a reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but rather life from the dead? It's going to be a miracle, he's saying. If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also holy. In other words, the church exists because of Israel, and there's a holy lump there that God is saying, I'm working with that. And that's what, I, well, that's what I'm doing. But he goes on and he gives, does, gives another comparison. And he says, if some of the branches of this olive branch were broken off, and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them, became a partaker of them, of, of the rich root of the olive tree. He's talking to the Gentiles there. We're grafted into the olive tree. We're grafted into what Israel is. We are God's people. But he says, but don't be arrogant toward the branches. For if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. We have a Jewish root. We have a Jewish foundation. And as we look at this, what we see is, is that Israel's resistance toward the Lord resulted in the church. We should always remember that our faith has Jewish roots. The ultimate purpose of Israel's fall was twofold. Number one, the salvation of the Gentiles. That's interesting. But secondly, the, 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 the second reason for the fall is the future restoration of the Jews. God promised that if you, my people, the Israelite people, if you fall into idolatry, if you fall into these other things, you're going to face certain areas of condemnation. You're going to face a fall, so to speak. And that fall is what brought about the church, yes. But that fall also is going to bring about a great glorious climax to God's historical plan of salvation. And the olive branch, with branches broken and branches grafted in, that is what God is working through, according to this passage. Now there's a warning about arrogance for us. Don't be conceited, but rather be reverent. We shouldn't be conceited. We should be fearful, it says. We should have reverence toward God and toward the fact that God says, I will bless those that bless Israel. I will curse those that curse Israel. Genesis chapter 12. And that warning is we need to be careful. We shouldn't forsake the Jewish nation. We shouldn't look down on the Jewish nation. I know people that do. I know people that have been involved in certain areas of persecution. But that's not what God wants. Since the Reformation, many scholars have ignored the promises made to Israel in the Old Testament. There are seminaries, evangelical seminaries, that preach the gospel. They preach Christ as Lord and Savior, but they fail to recognize the Jewish root. And they basically, they look at Israel saying, God's done. God's finished. And that's a mistake. And there are churches around us that teach that. They look at Israel and say, well, God, they rejected God, so God's rejected them. That's not true. I, Romans 11 says that. And since the Reformation, scholars have ignored the promises made to Israel in the Old Testament. They fail to recognize that it says God will bless those that bless Israel and will curse those that curse Israel. And I can't say what that curse is precisely. God's the one that brings about that, that particular aspect of that. But that's a reality, and I don't want to fall into, under God's curse. The natural branches will be grafted into the olive tree. Israel's going to be restored in that olive tree, it says right here in chapter 11. Now the next section, verses 25 through 32, let me read. It says, For I do not want you, brothers and sisters, to be uninformed of the mystery, so that you will be... Uh, so you will not be wise in your own estimation, but you need to understand a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles will come in. So that all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. Christ is going to come back and he's going to minister. He's going to take the throne in the second coming. It says, and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. That's going to happen in the future. 
from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. But just as you once were disobedient to God, now they have been shown mercy because of their disobedience. We were Gentiles. We didn't come from the righteous root. We came from the pagan background. It says now, so these who have now been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they may also be shown mercy. So there's a turnaround. We became the church, God's people, because of what the Jewish people did and were their resistance. And now because of our faithfulness, God is going to send Christ back to snatch us up and take us to glory in the rapture. But the Jews then, he's going to start dealing with the, the judgment here on earth and the Jews. They're going to be Jewish evangelists during the tribulation. They're going to be Jewish people that are coming to faith. It's going to be one of the greatest revivals in history. And it says there, how much greater will be the restoration earlier in this chapter? And what we find in this is that Israel will be restored into God's favor because God's gracious gifts and callings will never be reserved, re revoked. Never revoked. Israel suffered a partial hardening until the church is complete. We're in that process of completing the church. We preach the gospel. We teach others. We disciple. And Israel is in a partial hardening. The fullness of the Gentiles is the time of the rapture. When the church is complete, when all the Gentiles that will, in fact, during this age come to faith, God says, that it's done. And I'm going to start with a new, a new dispensation, a new period of time. And God will show mercy to Israel during the tribulation. In fact, he's going to cut the tribulation short because if he didn't, all humanity would be destroyed that is still here. But God's got a plan for the future that includes the millennial kingdom. And God's plan will be fulfilled with Jewish people trusting Christ. Jewish people trusting Christ. And therefore, we come to the final section of this passage. And we read here, and it says, Okay, oh, the depth. Oh, the, in fact, verse 32, For God has shut up all, the, all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. In the kingdom to come, he's going to show mercy to all. And it says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Or who has known, for who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor, or who is who has first given to him that which it might be paid back to him again, for from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So what do we find in this? God's purposes are not something that we can all figure out. And God's plans, in fact, there was a song written years ago, a song by, I forget the name of the artist, but it was, What a Strange Way to Save the World. Sending Jesus Christ through a virgin and through the plan of salvation and through all of that. God's plans and purposes are not what we would think up. God's purposes are locked up in the wealth of his wisdom. His wisdom is filled with riches. We read the book of Proverbs and it talks about how God's plans are always perfect. And our plans are always going to be weighed against God's perspe perspective. God's plans are absolutely astounding and they're above our ability to completely comprehend. And that leads us to Isaiah 55, for instance. Isaiah 55, where we, where we read, Seek the Lord while he may be found. This is a warning to the Israelite nation, but I believe this is also a warning to the Gentiles. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God and he will abundantly pardon. That's for all history. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. 
For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth, making it bare and sprout, and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, empty without accomplishing what I desire, without succeeding in the manner for which I sent it. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. God's thoughts are infinite. Our thoughts are finite. And we look at God's word and say, this is the message that needs to go out to the world. It's not a man-centered message. It's not a man-created message. It's a God-centered, God-created message. And basically, it says, my word will, which goes forth from my mouth will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire. God's promise is that he will restore Israel. God is going to accomplish through the church what he wants to accomplish. God's plans will never be thwarted. And we need to be obedient. As I close last week's message with what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, the wise man built his house upon the rock, the foolish man built his house upon the sand. He says, don't be foolish. He says, why is it that so often... You don't do as I say. What's the message? We go out and preach the gospel. We go out and preach the word to the world. And we see that as such an important reality. But we also note from this, we, we see where, where uh, Psalm 94, in fact, let me turn there for, for a moment. Psalm 94. Psalm 94, verse 14. It says, in fact, we start earlier, verse 12. Blessed is the man whom you chasten, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law, that you may grant him relief from his days of, a of adversity until a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not abandon his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance. For judgment will again be righteous, and all the upright in heart will follow it. Who will stand up for me against the evildoers? Who will take a stand for me against those who do wickedness? God says, my promises are faithful. My promises are certain. And God will not forsake those that, to whom he is, he is called. And we need to understand that. We can look at, at Psalm 106, just a very brief thing. I, I, I want to make careful note of my time here, but Psalm 106 Verses 44 through 48, we read this and it says here, it says, Nevertheless, he looked upon the distress of those that were facing challenges, and he heard their cry. He remembered his covenant for, for their sake. God remembers his promises for the sake of those that are his chosen people. The Israelite people will be restored. We are, we are saved because God... In the, in, the, in the times of his, history past, before the foundation of the world, he chose. He'll have mercy upon whom I want to have mercy. I will give grace to those upon whom I want to give grace. We don't understand election. We don't understand how it all took place. But God will, will, will make sure that all those that are called to be his will become his. And we, we see that in this passage. And it says at the end of that, Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations. Those are the Jewish people speaking. Give, we, to give thanks to your holy name and glory to your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting even to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen, praise the Lord. We're mindful of Deuteronomy chapter 7, where Moses writes, and he says, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. He has chosen you to be his people, prized above all others on the face of the earth. It is not because you are more numerous than all other peoples that the Lord has favored and chose you. For in fact, you were the least among all peoples. Rather, it is because of his love for you and his faithfulness to the promise he solemnly vowed to your ancestors that the Lord brought you out, of, out with, with great power out of the land of Egypt, redeeming you from the place of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So realize the Lord your God is a true God, 
the faithful God, who keeps covenant faithfully with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations, who pays back those who hate him as they deserve. That's God's promise. Pay back the judgment and he destroys them. He will not ignore those who hate him, but he will repay them as they deserve. So keep the commandments, the statutes, and the ordinances, and I today am commanding you to do so. We see that and we recognize God is a faithful God. And we need to understand that, that, that God's purposes are locked up in His, in the wealth of His wisdom. So we have some, some practical conclusions to apply. Number one, God never breaks His promises. Never, ever. His promises for positive blessings and benefits, yes. He says, I'll bless those, and I promise that I'll bless, but I'll curse those, and he promises that he'll punish. And Genesis 12 says, I'll bless those that bless you, Israel, and I'll curse those that curse you. I don't look at that promise as something that God is ever going to break. And I today, I, 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 I respect the nation of Israel. I don't understand how God's at work there. I don't understand how that all fits together. But I recognize that God never breaks his promises for positive or for punishment, either one. Secondly, pride leads to discipline and eventually to destruction. Taking God's grace for granted is a drastic decision. We find in, in that passage in Romans chapter 11, we find there that, that uh, as, as God expresses those things, he says, be careful be cautious. He says, um, okay, um, I'm, I'm losing the passage right now. He says, it, it's, it, you know, he says, grace is grace, and, 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 and if, it's, if it's by works, it's no longer grace. Uh, he says, Israel's hardened for a temporary period of time. Um, he says, I, you know, transgression, salvation, transgression of Israel, so because of that, salvation came to the Gentiles to make them jealous. But then he says, uh, okay, um, I'm sorry, it's funny. Here I am in front of the camera and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, making... Uh, he says, don't be arrogant toward the branches. Don't take my grace for granted. I sent Israel into uh, a place of, of, of basically setting apart. And I could put you in a place of setting apart, he's basically saying. And I see that we're happening in the church today. In fact, now I remember exactly what I put down in my notes. I don't have those notes in front of me, but... You know, there's, there's promise here in, in the scriptures. In, in First and Second Thessalonians, there's a promise. There's going to be delusion that's going to take place. And the church is going to go wayward. And churches are going wayward. We see that happening around us. That's God's plan for the, for the, for the time of the ages, the, the, the plan for the ages. And there's, there are going to be churches that are going to go into apostasy. And God says, be careful. Don't be arrogant. Don't be one of those. Don't, don't get arrogant and think, okay, you know, we can, we can do things the way we want to do them. God says, be careful about that. Recognize that you're part of a branch, you're part of a, an olive tree. And that olive tree, its, its foundation is holy because it is from that Jewish root, from the Messiah. And he basically says, don't take that for granted. And what does it happen when we take God's grace for granted? It robs God of, of his glory. God doesn't take kindly to that. It ruins the testimony of the church. I know churches whose testimonies have been absolutely just torn apart. They've been ruined because people took God's grace for granted. And what we find here is that we see where God is, is absolutely glorious, God is gracious, and God is generous. We should never take that for granted. Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21 says, Now to him who is able to do far abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, God's in charge. He's the one that brings about the, 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 all the blessings and all the various things that we, that we need for, for our ministries and for everything else. God can do beyond what we ever ask or think. 
And he, he provides the power that works within us, the Holy Spirit. And it says, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. God's glory, God's grace, God's generosity, he deserves glory, absolutely. And then finally, our response to God's wisdom. Three things. No one knows the mind of the Lord. We see in Scripture where we find out, we get a glimpse of it. But we can never figure out how God's mind works. God's ways are above our ways. God's ways are far beyond what we can ever completely grasp. We take his word through the power of the Holy Spirit and we say, Hey, I want to obey. God, I need your help. Father, I need you. Secondly, no one can advise or counsel God. I can't in my prayer say, God, you need to do this. You need to do that. I don't advise God. God advises me. God never asks for advice from his creatures. Jesus never asked for anyone's opinion for advice. Never once. God is above and beyond. His ways are beyond our thoughts. Infinite compared to finite. And finally, no one has ever given God anything that would put him into a position of conflict or controversy. God is in charge. God is independent of his creation. He gives us the privilege of being his, separate, his participants in his plan. And God will never share his glory with another. And we look towards God's glory and we recognize that God gives us the privilege of being part of his plan, part of his work toward what brings glory into this world. And we pre present the gospel of God's glory, the gospel of God's grace, the gospel of God's generosity. That's who we are. That's what we're doing. But it's God's message. And we need to understand that. So as we close this today, I just want us to be encouraged. God gets the glory. To God be the glory for the great things he has done. And let's ask God to enable us to bring glory and honor to him in everything we say, do, and how we act. Father, help us. Help us bring glory to you. You deserve more glory than we can ever understand or what we can ever give. And therefore, God, help us, enable us, strengthen us, provide for us what's necessary so that you will receive glory, honor, and praise in all things that we do, all things that we think, all things that, that, that we try to carry out, Father. Help us to be what brings glory to you. Use us, Father, thank you for the choice you made of giving us what you, we, what you promised to give us in eternity past. Thank you for that reality. Help us to realize you never break a promise, whether it be a promise of positive or a promise of punishment. Help us to realize, Father, that yes, we have eternal salvation. We learned that in Romans chapter 8 for sure. We've seen it in other passages too. You will never, we're never separated from your love. We're never separated from what you've done for us, Father. But yet we might face the challenges and the disciplines because sometimes we do take your grace for granted. So, Father, please help us give you glory, honor, and praise forever and ever, please. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, hey, sermon on Sunday in person. I may make some adaptations, but yet, nonetheless, I trust that God can use what we've seen here. He can use it for his glory because God's a wondrously powerful God and he deserves every bit of glory we can ever give. And we need to ask him to help us give that glory to him. Lord bless. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being part. Looking forward to hearing from you. Look forward to seeing you. And I just praise God for the privilege we have of being his, his people. Lord bless now.